Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. And today we are interviewing the wonderful Vlad Costea. And Vlad, before I ask how you're doing, uh, I'll give you a very quick intro of you to our audience. Uh, please feel free to correct me or do a better one. Uh, so Vlad is a uh, Bitcoiner, writer, historian, um, and the man behind the Bitcoin Takeover podcast and website. Uh, how are you doing today? How's things going? Well, that was very correct. And I'm happy that you didn't mention my previous affiliations. Like there was a time when somebody wanted to interview me and was like, can we say that you used to write for Bitcoin magazine in the description? And I was like, uh, you know, I hate it just because uh, that was like almost two years ago. So it's like I haven't done anything interesting in the meantime. So I very much appreciate that you presented me as someone who does stuff, still does stuff on his own project. And it's really exciting, you know? I'd be really interested like to kind of, often what I like to do with the with the podcast is like trying to go to the beginning of like your sort of life when it comes to Bitcoin, right? So like I wondered, um, simple question really, how did you um, come across Bitcoin in the first place? And what was it about it that actually kind of appealed to you and spoke to you? Because differs from person to person, right? I remember reading about it in 2012, 2013. And I thought, that's stupid. Like, how does any of this make sense? Why should I care about this kind of money? I have my credit card. I can buy virtually anything. It can get converted. You know, the local currency can get converted automatically by the bank into any international currency. So why does any of this make sense? And then I get, again, I was like 2021 20, at the time. I had no education in economics. I had no education in, you know, money censorship and getting canceled. And I suppose that what I needed in time was to get as many experiences and understand that just because I'm doing very well and I can basically participate in the global economy however I want, it doesn't mean that it's the ideal way for myself. And it doesn't mean that the rest of the world is just as privileged. So I think I got in 2017 for the number go up aspect, even though I was very much interested in 2015 when I did a project at the university and I made a presentation about Bitcoin. And then I wanted to buy in 2016 when I was interested in writing my thesis about internet governance. And I was looking on dark web website just to see what's there and what's going on. And I didn't get into Bitcoin in 2016 because there was this blog post by Mike Hearn at the time who rage quit. He was one of the main developers and he went to some of the mainstream media publications and started talking trash about Bitcoin and said that it doesn't scale. It's a failed project. We should not pay attention to it anymore. At the time also the price crashed. And when I read that and I was still in my you know, university days when I thought that just because it's the Wall Street Journal then it's a reliable source. I did not get into Bitcoin. So it took me three attempts to actually get it right and understand why this exists and why this has a long-term sustainability. And it's going to be around in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. It might even outlive us. And that's the moment when it actually made sense to me, when I realized, okay, this is truly a decentralized project. And I feel a bit ashamed that in the beginning, I was more attracted to Ethereum just because it was saying all the nice stuff that I was expecting to hear and all the stuff that I could ever dream of, only to turn out that it's an unscalable clusterfuck, which uh, can I swear on this show? I don't know. Sorry. Feel free. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I was disillusioned with Ethereum early on after I figured out that it, you know, something like CryptoKitties can basically clog the blockchain. So you're supposed to have unstoppable applications, but someone is going to vet your application and decide, you know, this should not be around. So there is this social layer of discouragement, which says that you should do something or you should not do it because it's not useful, even if they say it's decentralized. And if it's permissionless and decentralized, then it needs to scale. And if it needs to scale in the current design, it needs a lot of storage. So Ethereum is just doomed, if you ask me. It it exists because it's useful for some projects like stable coins and stuff, 
but I don't see it succeeding just like Bitcoin because I'm proud of the community that we accomplished in 2017 when I was still a newbie. I was not running a node actually, but the node runners managed to activate SegWit. And that was a very long debate, which started, I think, in 2015. And the miners were supposed to activate themselves SegWit, just like they did with Taproot a month ago. And they did not signal at the right time. And it was the perfect storm. It was the perfect coordination. And it proved that no entity, regardless of how wealthy or how influential, is in charge or in control of Bitcoin. You can just have users organize themselves and do the exact opposite with their nodes of what the miners are doing and take control and take their power back, which I think is unprecedented for any project and is the reason why I'm bullish long-term on this project. And bullish, not necessarily just in terms of fiat money appreciation, but in terms of the success of the project and the way that it expands and it scales, not just at the network level, but also at the social level. Vlad, you just mentioned Taproot. Uh, I wanted to know, are you optimistic about Taproot being added to Bitcoin? Yeah, very much. Like, you can be conservative and say that it might be too early to update your node client and stuff like that, to which I can agree. But at the same time, it's it's been reviewed and it's been tested for at least one year. And you have had the code out there for a while. And what it does very well is to make transactions more efficient and more private. That's the whole point of it. And I like this whole idea that instead of scaling by increasing the block size, we're actually decreasing the size of transactions. So instead of making the blocks bigger to fit more transactions of the same design with the same signatures, we're actually making the signatures smaller. So you put more of them in the same existing blocks, which I think is more of an elegant design and something that we need more of as opposed to thinking or blindly believing that something like Moore's law is going to help us scale and taking out normal users from this self-validation process, which is so essential for the decentralization of the project. So something which your first answer kind of brought up for me, and sorry to kind of go back again a little bit, but um, obviously, but as you said, like you know, getting to Ethereum first, uh, there's no shame, you know, I got into double coins first. Um, but um, yeah, you said, you said obviously that you weren't that into like, or you hadn't been that educated in like the economic side of things. Um, and I, I wondered, I guess, um, so obviously you're from Romania, right? And obviously there's a, there's history of like inflation in Romania from my understanding um, and also like other sort of financial issues. Um, so I guess like, what was it or what was it that kind of got you into the economic side of things and like the understanding of central banking and the understanding of inflation and, and things like that? Was that something that came after Bitcoin in 2017 or was that something that came before that? And then you kind of saw Bitcoin and were like, oh, okay. Yeah, which way around was it, I guess, that, that kind of got you to, to think about that side of things? I always tell the story about my parents who had their wedding in 1989. Just, I think it was one month before the Romanian revolution, which overthrew communism. And they raised a lot of money at the wedding because that's the tradition that the parents and the friends, everyone gives them money to start a new life. And they put that money aside, hoping that they would be able to start a new life and buy a car. That was their goal at the time. And in communism, if you wanted to buy a car, you had to deposit the money in the government's account and then wait for one year for your car to get delivered. That was kind of the standard way of buying a car. There was a monopoly of the state and there was only one type of car that you could buy. So it's kind of terrible. But what happened then was that the revolution came and the regime got thrown away, which meant that the previous establishments were kind of dubious. You had no idea if the arrangements were still going to happen or if you're going to settle that transaction in a different way. So the money that they deposited never actually bought them a car. So ne they never got it. But a couple of years later, the state decided that they can reimburse the money. But by the time that they got the money back, the inflation had taken its toll. So with the same money that they could buy a car on their wedding day, they were only able to buy a couch in the bedroom. And, you know, that kind of hurts. And they were still happy that they could get something back, which is interesting and a paradox. And honestly, when I first, first read about Bitcoin, I did not know this story because 
you don't really get to learn about your parents as adults until you grow up and they start telling you stuff. They treat you like a child up to, I guess, 25 or something. And once you get to meet them as adults, you start learning all of these stories about what happened. And also I have grand grandparents who before communism came around, they had small businesses. And by small businesses, I mean, I had a grand grandparent who was, was running an operation, a business with glass, just replacing glass windows. And just because he had employees, he had a couple of employees working for him. He was declared an enemy of the state and he had everything taken away from him. So in these two examples that actually happened in my family and are not singular, you can find lots of them in my country, I've described confiscation and inflation, two of the components that central banking and the state use against you. And once you figure this out and you understand how it works, Bitcoin makes a lot more sense to you and you realize, okay, this actually has a purpose in my life and I can learn from the previous generations that got screwed and actually try to do better with my life. I'm not saying that I am doing better because the challenges are different with every generation. And if my parents were able to access housing and get an apartment very easily, in my case, it's a lot more difficult. And I guess you all, all of you know that real estate is very expensive for our generation. And you basically have to get a loan and work your entire life to be able to get that. But, you know, I'm I'm still working on that. Well, so obviously, as you said, um, there's a plus side of, of Bitcoin, right, is that it's uh, relatively unsensible. And obviously, it's uh, to a degree, again, unseizable unless you're an absolute plank and you've stored it in like an American exchange when you're extorting people, <laughs> whatever it was that happened with the FBI seizing uh, Bitcoin. Um, but I guess one criticism that someone could have, I suppose, with Bitcoin is that on the sensible side of things, um, I've always felt that Bitcoin was uncensorable. And then along comes, uh, it was a couple of months back now, but we had uh, that um, American mining group. I think they said they weren't going to do it again, but they had that blank block, I think, to show. Yeah, Marathon. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. To prove that they could sense, essentially censor and not accept transactions from certain individuals, should they wish. Um, that goes along with like FATF guidelines, I think it was. Uh, I say it's a little bit, my memory's not that great with it, but I guess what, because obviously what, what are your thoughts on that? I suppose, is that like a, do you see that as like a, a kind of a weakness potentially in Bitcoin? Or I suppose, do you think of like the other flip side where you can say, well, hey, miners can choose not to include a transaction, but there's always going to be another miner that you know, may want to kind of thing. Like, I wonder what you thought on, on that when it, when it occurred. I think it's a major concern and we should all think about it. Because right now we trust in some miner around the world that we don't know. And if we were to define being a Bitcoiner, according to some developers, you're not a true Bitcoiner unless you also run your own mining rig. And I know it's not very practical and the energy costs usually are greater than your returns when you mine from home. But I'm actually looking these days into solutions that I can use to mine from home. I've actually found somebody from the USA who's producing home mining devices like ASICs, and they cost about $600 or something. They're not as powerful as ant miners and stuff like that, but at the same time, they consume very little power and they are quiet, which I think these two criteria are great. And if we as a community somehow discovered, and if there was a market for this, because somehow it, it makes me wonder why the Bitcoin project has grown so tremendously and yet you find ASICs so with such great difficulty. Like you should be able to access equipment to be able to participate in securing the network. And the fact that the mining is moving from China, which I think for all of their flaws and for all of the flaws of their government has treated, has treated Bitcoin mining a lot better than the USA right now. And the USA is trying to put too many regulations and everyone seems to be like a rent seeker who's trying to make money off of this new mining operation. So I think that we as a community should respond to this, not by blaming one part or the other, not by pressuring miners, because that can also be useful on the short term, but it relies on good faith. And you have to believe that everyone else is going to be a good actor. But if you really want to help the network, you should consider ways in which you can purchase a device that you run from home. 
and you also have to consider running it altruistically so not expecting any gains in the short term or the midterm and maybe that you're going to break even or make a profit sometime during the bull market but this is essential for us to secure the network and i hope that in the coming months the coming years we're gonna have more devices even if they get marketed as lottery tickets or something so you mine and you might just win the big prize of a block reward if you're lucky but even if you do that it's still useful for the network and i know people who worm their homes with asics that's not very practical if you can see it's very hot in here and at the time when we are doing the interview i have the sun which is on my side and that's why my face is red but i don't think heating is practical for all regions of the world there are parts of the world where it's very hot usually and the winter only lasts for a month or two but where you can actually heat your home that can be a good solution but for us we need something low powered quiet so that it doesn't distract attention and you can actually sleep in the same room and also good enough to contribute to the network security so i did not answer your question at all and i don't care much about marathon but i care about the bitcoin project and my approach to it is that Instead of complaining of who does what, we should take matters into our own hands and mine from home, either solo, which increases the difficulty and makes you very unlikely to actually mine a block. It might take years. Or you can join some sort of mining pool, which is ethical, and switch from one to the other. Because for all of this mining centralization that we like to blame, the fact that I can buy an S9 or something on the used market and mine with Ant Pool or F2 Pool, both of them being from China, it doesn't mean that I'm participating in Chinese mining in any way. It might mean that I'm helping them maximize their profits by increasing the hash rate that gets added to that pool. But I'm mining from here in Romania with a mine with an operation that actually takes place in China or the Czech Republic with Slush Pool or I guess there will be many more American companies that get into mining now. But my point is that we should all contribute to this just like we run nodes. I just wanted to ask, have you heard of the Stratum V2 uh, mining protocol, which is supposed to kind of make mining more efficient for individual miners who join pools and like make it more equitable? Yes, I think Matt Corallo contributed to that one. Or I think that's nice hash. Either way, I think Stratum is already implemented in Slush Pool, and they are working with it. And it would be nice if more pools actually used it. But this is part of the game theory, you know. If you don't, if you participate in pool mining and you don't like that one pool does not implement something like Taproot or something like Stratum V2, then you can switch to the one that does. I don't know why a lot of miners don't do this. Maybe that. Maybe solo miners, and not solo, they operate something from home and they join the network that's most likely to give them constant rewards. And that's what they do. So they just flock around the biggest player, which might be F2 pool right now. Maybe that's what their consideration is because they want to break even with their electricity costs. But at the same time, we should also think about what's good for the network. And Unfortunately, what's good for the network is not always the most profitable, even though there's this idea that the Nakamoto consensus has solved it all. Well, for example, running a node is not in any way beneficial for yourself monetarily. It helps you get privacy. It helps you validate your own transactions. So you get also sovereignty, but you don't make any money. So you do it at your own expense and you pay a price for the advantages that you get when you run your own node. And I see with mining kind of the same situation. You should always also do it by yourself. And you should also consider that when you mine and you actually find a block, and even if you split the reward with some pool, you're also getting some non-KYC Bitcoins. So you're basically getting money that was not yet bought by Michael Saylor and KYC forever. Uh, one thing that I see as a major problem 
in the world slash internet really at the moment um actually rather than just bitcoin is is censorship so you've got things like facebook and youtube with the demonetization and the blocking of and the deletion of accounts and, and lots more that can kind of you can actually ruin people's entire incomes uh Alex Jones, for example, you know, not, not that I necessarily agree with the guy, but, you know, lost pretty much everything. And yeah, Donald Trump being removed from Twitter and Facebook and multiple YouTubers. Um, I, I guess, are there any ways that you can see Bitcoin and like the people around it and the ecosystems that are built around it assisting with the sort of censorship issue that's going on in the internet as a whole right now? Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that, I suppose. Most people use Bitcoin in a custodial way. And that's an ugly truth that we need to fix. It's a truly permissionless and voluntary network. It's a project where you can contribute and you can help it and you can also help yourself. And the fact that most people buy their Bitcoins on eToro as ETFs, not ETFs, what do you call them? Mm. I, I don't get the abbreviation right now, but moving on, it, it's like paper money. It's like, I, I don't have a bill right here, but it's something that's supposed to be backed by some sort of asset that is hold, that is held by the custodian. So thinking about it, the fact that there are so many people and there are friends of mine who keep their coins on Kraken, for example, because they say they have such a good record with user funds and they were never hacked. And these two criteria are enough for them to give up on their sovereignty and say, yeah, but at least I have the advantages of being insured if something goes wrong. There are always trade-offs, so I can understand that. And some people search for the convenience and don't like to embrace sovereignty. But we should onboard more people in a way that is not or does not revolve around custodians because that's one major problem. Not only that, it strips away all of the qualities of the Bitcoin network and the only advantage that a user might have at some point by using custodial Bitcoin is the number go up component because it's not censorship resistant as the custodian can decide to block a transaction or revert it. And it's not really a tool of sovereignty. It's more of a speculation. And if you only have the speculation part, to me, that's not really Bitcoin. That's more like, I don't know, gold ETFs or something like that. Investing in the stock market, getting V-Bucks in Fortnite, get, getting gold in World of Warcraft. I think that's the best comparison actually with gold in World of Warcraft because you can get it and the server can be shut down or there might be some administrator of the server who decides that you got it fraudul fraudul fraudulently or prevent you from selling it or decide that you stole it from some user. And that's not why Bitcoin exists. The network is supposed to provide all of these advantages that the fiat system does not have. And in order for every user to benefit from them, the user needs to run a node. And running a node today is the easiest it has ever been. Like the conversation two years ago revolved around trying to build or trying to run Linux on some old laptop and also running Bitcoin Core on that laptop. But I think with the development of ARM-based devices like the Raspberry Pi, which are very powerful, nowadays we have such an easy way for about $200, you can be your own bank and also benefit from all the privacy and all the sovereignty and all the censorship resistance of banks. And that's very important. And that's the only way in which Bitcoin can help us prevent the Alex Jones and other financial censorship situations. Otherwise, if you rely on custodians and believe that just because they have a good record, they're going to be incorruptible and they're going to keep on doing good stuff for Bitcoin, that's just wishful thinking. That's what I like to call hopium. You should not trust anyone with any of this stuff. It's your money. That's the whole point of the Bitcoin network to make you sovereign and put you in charge of your own money. If you can't handle that, I can understand that there might be custodians, but at least there should be the kind of education which makes you understand why you should run your own node and why you should be a first-class citizen of the network. We just interviewed Giacomo Zucco 
about token issuance and smart contracts on Bitcoin uh, with his RGB network. And RSK is also taking a different approach, but it's in the similar effort to bring uh, token issuance and smart contracts to Bitcoin. What are your thoughts on tokens on Bitcoin, colored coins and smart contracts? Yeah, so to me, that's the ultimate maximalist thesis, because on one hand, you have the maximalists who say that Bitcoin is perfect as it is, and it should only receive minor refinements like Taproot or something. And we should not integrate shitcoin stuff in it. And shitcoins will die just because they are more centralized and they don't have the same immaculate conception. And then there is the other side of maximalism, which considers that you should maximize the kind of stuff that revolves around Bitcoin. And you should build everything on top of it with layers because it's the most secure network and it has the best money that we have, the best decentralized money. And I tend to side with the second kind of category. And I think that it's useful to have side chains which provide the trade-off between security because obviously nothing is going to be as robust as the base layer of Bitcoin. But you're going to have a greater advantage in terms of maybe tokens, maybe more privacy with something like Monero or Zcash being a side chain of Bitcoin. And you can also have smart contracts, RSK, that's what it does. And I guess also drive chains, which are trying to also build big block side chains so that you can do on-chain transactions with low fees and a lot of scalability and someone is going to actually mine that chain. So to me, it's very interesting. Also the Lightning Network of which BitRefill is a huge fan. And I know that BitRefill was the first company to open a one BTC channel and then it kept on improving. And I think right now, I think you got to 10 BTC, the largest channel, and that's really impressive. It just proves that the company BitRefill really believes in Lightning as a second layer and as a payment mechanism. So I believe that the layers of Bitcoin are some of the most exciting and interesting parts. And what Giacomo Zucco is doing, as far as I know, it's tokenization on top of Lightning. I think he, he's still working on the RGB project. He was working on it two years ago when I was interviewing him. I haven't heard much about the project since, but I can only assume that it has evolved and gotten better. And it's really cool because it has client-side validation so that every participant to the network doesn't have to store everyone else's transactions and everyone else's operations. You store your own and interact with the network in this way. And it's on top of the Lightning Network, which is very decentralized nowadays. And I'm very proud to participate in the decentralization of Lightning. And I think it's one of the most noble activities that you can do today in Bitcoin to help the Lightning Network expand. And it can also get selfish because once you open a lot of channels, you're going to route somebody else's transactions. So you collect fees. So in the long term, it can make you rich, but you don't have great expectations for it, unless you're willing to put a lot of money. But I really like this kind of stuff. I like RSK, I like RGB. I'm not saying that it's degenerate altcoin, whatever. I think that if there's a market for it and there are people willing to do it and it doesn't affect the security of the base layer and it's gonna bring more people to the base layer of Bitcoin because in order to get to layer three, you actually need to get the underlying asset and take every step towards there, I'm happy about it. And I'm ac I've actually had a conversation with Joshua Shigala from Voltoro, and he wants to tokenize gold because he believes that the fact that you have about $12 trillion in gold sitting in vaults is actually kind of bad and you should be able to transact it more easily. So he's interested in tokenizing his own gold vaults and basically allowing users to change ownership a lot faster. And he took a look into it and he could theoretically do it on top of the Lightning Network. And he actually tried to do it with V Gold or something. That was two years ago, but it did not get traction because Lightning was not big enough. And today when there's another, another bull market, he had to do it on Ethereum just because there are more users on Ethereum and it's a lot easier to deploy code on it and there's a larger community of developers and stuff like that. So 
to him it was easier, but he believes that it, he should be able to return to Bitcoin and build something on a layer of, or something like a side chain or something on top of Lightning. And we should get there. That's what I think. Or else we're, we will only allow shit coins to exist. And they are shit coins, but it doesn't mean that they don't do something interesting or useful that can be adopted by Bitcoin in a layer. So glad. Um, interesting um, answer so far. Really a um, lot to unpack there. So what are your thoughts on the Bitcoin um, law in El Salvador where merchants are kind of like a coin, you know, if the customer does have Bitcoins offer, do you think um, it's the fact that it takes away the element of choice merchants? Do you think, you know, it's all a means to an end, which the end in this case being the adoption of Bitcoin? I'm happy that you asked me this question, Jerry, because I, I've spoken about it on the podcast quite a lot, but I'm going to present the argument to another audience also right now. And this goes back to the argument of being forced to be free. Like, can anyone step into your house and tell you, from now on, you're going to adopt this currency and it will set you free, but you're going to accept my authority and you're going to take my word for it. And you, you don't know yet why this is a good idea, but you have to trust me that I'm going to do the right thing for you. And a lot of people conclude in this situation that if it's for a good cause, then you should give up on your freedom and it should no longer be your free will. But I tend to think that Bitcoin adoption should not happen from the top. You should not have a politician telling you from now on you're going to use Bitcoin. If anything, I think that this project relies on individual contributions and is a projection of the libertarian and voluntarist side of the society. And we like to build stuff from grounds up, not take stuff from above and believe that there's going to be some sort of authority who's going to take care of us, who's going to be nice to us. And even though I can understand that some citizens in El Salvador are going to own some Bitcoin, I still have questions about how they're going to own it. Because as far as I know, the government is going to give them some amount and is going to give them the alternative to choose the wallet. But is it really a choice when the government has a wallet of their own, which is custodial? And then there's Tripe, which also has a custodial wallet and got the most attention. And then the president tells you, yeah, so I have developed with my team this wallet. And there's this friend of mine who has that wallet. They're custodial. But if you don't like it, you can download any wallet on your phone and get your money. But in reality, a lot of people don't really have a choice because they don't understand why there is a choice. So if you don't know why you should choose, you're going to go for the most convenient situation. And with El Salvador, I've also asked this question. If the users can choose between receiving their funds in a wallet, which charges them no fees, but is custodial, or another one which is totally free open source and puts you in charge and sovereign and everything else, connects your full node and makes you a true first class citizen of the Bitcoin network but charges fees. If you are a disinformed or a newbie who has no idea what, what's going on and why this is happening, are you really going to choose the sovereign way? And I tend to think that the answer is no, because people are going to follow the, their best economic interest without caring much about their privacy or their sovereignty or about unconfiscatability of their money. And this is why I think that we need a lot of education. We need a lot of podcasts. We need a lot of articles. We need a lot of magazines. We just need to spread the knowledge and not just in English, but in every language that we can speak and to anyone who is interested. And I don't believe that we should force anyone. There is a point in anyone's life when they start asking questions about their money, about their lives, about their finances, about their future. And that's when they will make sense out of it all. If they never ask questions, they're never going to take your answers. And while I agree that there are some people who only follow what the government tells them and therefore will only adopt Bitcoin when the government does it for them, I still don't think it's the right, it's the right way just because it goes against my system of beliefs. And I'm going to act personally so that I can help as many people get educated and understand how to be sovereign and be completely free as opposed to accepting that someone is going to be their liberator and master. The El Salvador topic has 
been a little bit divisive uh, on on Twitter and, and I think in general because I think a lot of people have different different differing philosophies, right? Like there's people who kind of have that uh, feeling of like the means justify the ends or whatever. So, um, but yeah, I can definitely understand your uh, your outlook or your view on it and like why you feel that way about the uh, the El Salvador law. It's something that sits a little bit iffy with me. It's kind of exciting that a country is adopting. Bitcoin, but it's also kind of a bit like uh, it's kind of being forced, and as you say, it might be in the wrong fashion that it's occurring. Um, I guess um, something that's a little bit uh, different in a topic, but um, when it comes to cause when it comes to online as well, like I see a lot of people very often talking about like hodling, like stacking Sats, holding onto Sats, like holding onto Bitcoin not spending it, not you know, essentially just trying to accumulate as much as possible. Um, and I, I wonder like what your sort of like advice is to people who are new or your perception of this is, because for me, like buying and holding onto Bitcoin and that's it and never actually spending it or trying to do anything, earning it, whatever, it kind of just doesn't really help all that much to me anyway like i feel like the circular economy is pretty important and i know that kind of goes along with bit refills uh philosophy probably too but uh but that is my personal philosophy um for various reasons that i'll probably tell you after after you've spoken but i just wanted to get your your views on that like are you kind of someone who strictly huddle spend quite a lot or kind of like try to balance it maybe you know give advice to your friends to kind of try to balance that what what, what kind of advice do you give and how do you see things uh, i don't think i'm in any position to tell people what to do with their own money so it's your money, it's your life. I don't have your experiences. I don't have your expectations. I'm not living in your specific situation. It's money. It, you should be using it however you want. If you think that it's going to become more precious in time and you can afford to huddle it, then go ahead and huddle it. But if you need to, I don't know, undergo some sort of surgery to help a family member who may be uh, goes through a terrible accident or something like that, and you have to choose between huddling and saving the life of someone who is dear to you, obviously, there is nothing more precious in this world than your own life or somebody else's that you hold dear. And I presented this example only because a couple of weeks ago, we have seen the news of Mit Chapopescu, who was a big Bitcoiner and the Romanian whale. At some point, he allegedly owned about 1 million Bitcoin. And it is believed that he held about a hundred thousand or more at the time when he died. And it's really unfortunate to know that, for example, his body was found in Costa Rica and no family member claimed it. He, I don't think he allowed the Bitcoins to be inherited by anyone. I'm fairly sure that they were lost forever. And it's just sad to think that he was 41, he had most likely about 30 more years ahead of him or more. And he had all the money in the world. He huddled so hard, but did not get to enjoy life in any way. And it really makes you wonder what your priorities are. And there really is no definitive answer for this. We, all of us, we expose ourselves to risks and we have different lives and we have a, to adjust to different conditions. So if you want to spend your money on something, go ahead and do it, but make sure my only advice is to think in terms of producing value. And if you think that the way that you spend your money is going to help you produce more value, if you buy a house and it's going to help you become more independent and it's going to help you start a new life, I think that's a very noble cause. And the fact that you don't hold on to your Bitcoins for 10 more years and choose to be independent. 10 years earlier, I think that's a good cause. Buying unnecessary stuff like Lambos and stuff like that. I mean, it's not up to me to say it's unnecessary. It's just that I think it's too much and nobody really needs a Lambo. There are some basic human needs that you can fulfill with your money and you should be fulfilling. I don't think Lambos are part of that or Teslas just to flex that Elon Musk has enabled payments for a couple of weeks to buy Teslas. So yeah, it's your money, you do whatever. I don't think an economy can actually function if everyone hoards it. And I, I think that most people on Twitter who brag about never selling are most likely LARPing and they are trying to build that sense of confidence within the community 
that everyone believes in the long-term success of the project because you see the same people going to conferences and driving expensive cars and wearing fancy clothes and paying for the drinks of everyone else around. And it makes you wonder how do they make so much money that they can buy so much Bitcoin, huddle it, and also live a life that's maybe not luxurious, but, you know, not really frugal either. And I'm pretty sure that many people who claim that they never sold any BTC actually did. I suppose, like, I guess, um, I think my, my concern is always that, like, I see things like, uh, for example, KYC uh, as a bit of a threat. Uh, for example, if a government wanted to stop people in, in a country from owning or buying or selling Bitcoin, an easy way is to essentially try and block it at the point of exchange to fiat currencies. Um, and like, I guess the, the easy defense to that is if we have a fairly robust circular economy built or a person manages to build up a bit of a sort of feeling where they're earning on Bitcoin and spending in Bitcoin and holding Bitcoin, then I feel like that's kind of like a really good natural defense to that threat because it's like, well, sure, block me from, you know, transferring my British pounds into Bitcoin. I don't give a damn because I'm already earning in it. I'm spending in it. I'm paying my rent in it, if you get what I mean. So that's why I guess I think... I get a bit frustrated at times with the the people on Twitter constantly saying hodl hodl or, or whatever, or they call me an, an idiot for like having bought something I needed to get once with Bitcoin when I only had Bitcoin. <laughs> I didn't have pounds, you know, like it was just a little bit silly um, to me. But I guess that's kind of where I was getting was that I think that building the circular economy is extremely important for that very, I think it adds more security essentially to the world of Bitcoin. You know, most people who got into Bitcoin in 2010, 2011, up to 2013, were mostly using Bitcoin as a way to not use fiat money. So to them, it was a way to opt out from the fiat economy. And then there was this whole movement which started saying, you know, you should be huddling onto your Bitcoin and not spending it. I think it's rooted in Gresham's law, which says that good money drives out the bad. So you should be spending the bad money first and leave the good money for savings, which makes sense. But at the same time, it depends on why you need to spend money and what you're trying to accomplish. If you want to be a sovereign individual, you should be spending your Bitcoins. If you want to afford to be unbanked in this world, then you should be spending your Bitcoins at various places or go to ATMs and get cash. I, I, unlike a lot of Bitcoiners, I'd like to think that we are going to need cash like always, and I don't see it going away because it's so useful. It's the most private form of money. Locally, when you go to somebody, you just hand them a piece of paper, they acknowledge that it has value, and they give you their goods or services in exchange. It's the most efficient, fastest, internet proof, and I don't know, atomic nuclear attack, meteor strike, or solar flare proof kind of payment. And not only this, but I'm actually developing and thinking about ways in which you can use Bitcoin as cash. So you can issue banknotes that have some sort of cryptographic proofs and also allow you to verify that there is Somewhere in an account, there's a corresponding amount of Bitcoin, which backs the amount written on the piece of paper. And it also proves that it's unique and it was not replicated. So yeah, that's where I'm at nowadays. I think a lot about cash and how we can actually make transactions off the chain, off the record, off the internet, with Bitcoin that are stored, most likely in my idea, they are, they are stored by a custodian. So for example, let's say that BitRefill issues banknotes worth of 10 BTC and there's going to be 0.01 Bitcoin on each banknote. So that means it's going to be 10,000 banknotes that can be used all across the world. And if somebody wants to exchange that banknote for their Bitcoin, they just go to BitRefill and they give it back to BitRefill and they receive the corresponding amount of Bitcoin, just like banknotes used to be backed by gold in the early days. But the difference is that nowadays we have many more cryptographic proofs to help you not get fooled like you are getting in the early days of banking and in the later days of fiat of the fiat system where you ended up having unnecessary and abusive inflation. 
So I'm not sure if you agree with me, but we can actually make Bitcoin work as cash. And I think it's a good cause. I think it's like a pretty uh, ambitious idea, but like, hey, I, I don't necessarily think I disagree nor agree at the moment. Um, but I remember years and years and years ago, uh, talked to my grandfather before I, I think I even knew what Bitcoin was about like the danger of society losing cash for that privacy aspect. And my concern about like just having a number on the screen that the government could essentially, or a bank could just go boop, boop, and just delete. You know, that was a big concern of mine, 2010 or whatever, 20, 2009, when I had never heard of Bitcoin. So uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea. I'd like to see you give it a go, that's for certain. There's actually a guy whose name is Damien Lerner, and he's the co-founder of the RSK sidechain. And he has developed a money system which doesn't rely on a central issuer and is actually backed by Bitcoin. So basically, he created a system of Bitcoin banknotes that you can use and issue in a way that can be transacted physically, locally, and without any sort of custodian. I'm not sure how it works, but he is a cryptographer, which I'm not. And he might know a little more about it. And I can tell you that Peter Todd, who used to be a Bitcoin developer, a Bitcoin core developer, is also a fan of this idea. And also Charlie Lee, I think, when I started thinking about it once again, because this has, has been on my mind for a few years, but I, when I started thinking about it recently, it was because of a tweet by Charlie Lee about El Salvador. And he said that now El Salvador is going to need cash that's backed by Bitcoin. And he was made fun of by some people and was like, ah, ha, ha, paper money, that's what Bitcoin is supposed to replace. But it's not really paper money. It's the underlying asset that's trying to replace. So we might even end up having all of the services that fiat money is having today, like Patreon, but backed by Bitcoins. I think Patreon is like a layer four of the fiat system because you have the monetary supply and then you have banks and then you have payments processors like PayPal. And on top of them, you have donation services like GoFundMe and Patreon and stuff like that. I think we can also have something similar with Bitcoin, but it's going to happen with the kind of money that can be verified and whose supply you know and has a very transparent monetary policy. And the point, in my opinion, is not to replace entirely the means, but the underlying asset. I wanted to know if you use privacy wallets like Wasabi Wallet or Join Market. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of them. And even though I know that there are trade-offs and some exchanges may not allow you to move your coins after they had been coin joined, and you actually need to move them around for a few times until they no longer get blackmailed. I'm not sure how many times, it depends on the exchange. But I believe that this is very much necessary to make the currency fungible because I think the only characteristic of Bitcoin that the only sound money characteristic that Bitcoin does not have is fungibility. One coin is not really equal to the other because they have different transaction histories. They might have different associations like a Bitcoin from 2010 is most likely or has most likely been on the Silk Road at some point. And you can either not like that and not accept the coin or move on and say, you know, it's money, it should be fungible. And we need tools that make it fungible. And I might be biased here because my podcast is sponsored by Wasabi Wallet, but I have been a user of Wasabi since 2019, since one of the earliest versions of it. And I very much enjoyed the way that it provides privacy, not just in terms of coin joins, but also at the network level. And in terms of downloading blocks, even if you're not running a node, it downloads blocks instead of relying on somebody else's node to get validation. So it's like running a pruned node locally. It downloads the blocks that you need to manage your own transactions. And it also has some nice features in terms of not allowing somebody to lurk over your shoulder to see how much money you have. It's called lurker wipe mode. And what else does it do? It prevents address reuse. So when you use an address, you no longer have it on the clipboard in the menu. So you can only reuse addresses on purpose if you actually try to do it, but you're not going to have them on your list after you had used them at least once. 
So these are all very small things that you get when you use Wasabi, but they truly matter and they really help because network level and not reusing receiving addresses are actually very important for your own privacy and for understanding how Bitcoin is supposed to work. When I first got into Bitcoin, I think the wallets at the time, most the most popular of them at least, did not even allow you to generate multiple addresses. You only had one address that you were using for all of the transactions. And I think that's what Ethereum has because Ethereum has no UTXOs. And I like to regard it as some sort of Orwellian nightmare because you can see on anyone's domain what they are up to, what they receive, what they send. I don't think that's the point of this. The transparency only exists for the purpose of auditing the supply to make it clear that there is no inflation. But I don't think that this should be the end game to see everyone else's transaction. And if there is any proposal for more Bitcoin privacy, I'm pretty sure that I will be in favor as long as it doesn't break consensus and it's going to be a soft fork. But if we have a forced hard fork because something breaks and they also add something for privacy, I'm going to be a fan of that. What are your thoughts on the Bitcoin mining, mining council? Um, do you see, I, I'm aware that they are trying to, you know, spread, they're trying to dispel all forms of FUD regarding Bitcoin mining and how it boils the ocean and all that, you know, stuff, all that, you know, nonsense. But what are your thoughts? Do you think that we should have such a centralized entity that in, in a certain fashion would act like the face of Bitcoin regards, you know, you know, Bitcoin mining, or do you think that, you know, it, it, there could be a future threat in the sense of the, uh, if you remember the New York agreement and the whole segwit, you know, you know, scuffle and, and in that fashion, do you think it, it could be something, it becomes something more of a threat in the future or it's, it's, it's nothing we should worry about? Yeah, so I'm not a fan. I could never endorse the project like that. And it's basically just a bunch of rich people who bought a lot of Bitcoin and decided that they should create some sort of authority for themselves and put themselves in a situation where they are spokespeople of Bitcoin mining in North America. And I don't think that's fair. There are people mining from home and they should not be represented by these people. And I don't know, it's kind of the situation where you can't really do anything about it. You can disagree, you can try to troll them. And that has been the case with lots of attempts. I think there was at some point Nakamoto.com, a quote unquote pro Bitcoin website where all of the big blockers were writing articles trying to explain to you what Bitcoin is. And I think that one got shut down after the community became outraged by the fact that these people are trying to educate others on what Bitcoin should be. But there is nothing really that we can do about it except for helping others and trying to support the networks with our own means. So if you can mine from home or you can organize something so that you and your friends buy a miner or something and you split the rewards. And I, I don't know, there are so many approaches and scenarios to this. But if you can help the network by providing security by yourself, you should try to do it. And I hope that it's going to be profitable at some point. But these people who try to establish organizations, they're not really helping the environment. That's only the excuse that they're using. They are only trying to put themselves at the top and basically destroy, burn the bridge so that nobody else can get to their level in the future. And this has been the case in big tech. You can see how companies like Facebook and even Twitter, they try to monopolize by copying the features that other platforms have. Like Twitter, I'm not sure if you observed, but they encapsulated the use case of Clubhouse and that only took like a couple of months. And now nobody really uses Clubhouse anymore. They're on Twitter. And Instagram and Facebook have done the same with stories. They stole them from Snapchat and they established themselves as a stronger monopoly. And they might even file patents and prevent other small companies to get there and never make it. 
And if there's anything innovative, they're, they're going to purchase it or try to influence it or take it out of the business. That's only part of the game. And most of the times it's rigged and it's not even part of the free market because they involve the government and they try to get to pass laws that are favor favorable to them. And I think the mining council is trying to do something similar. I hope that this kind of approach is not going to be replicated in Europe, in Asia, or in any other organizations of states, because it's really terrible. And I hope that the game theory is going to discourage this and miners are going to migrate outside of these arrangements and they're going to go bankrupt or they're not going to succeed in the ways that they wish they would and capitulate, hopefully. But I don't know, it's not up to me to decide what they do with their time and with their Bitcoin. But we can only hope that we're going to support the network enough to make it stronger and make it more decentralized. Because we like to brag about decentralization a lot and say that this is a decentralized project. But really, how many of us actually help it become decentralized? Yeah, it's been great to have, have you on and great to talk to you. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure the, uh, the listeners appreciate it as well. Um, and obviously for anyone out there listening, thank you for listening as well. Um, but yeah, um, it, are there any sort of final things you wanted to, to say, I guess? Like, uh, is there anything you're working on at the moment that you wanted to just quickly talk about? Well, I'm working on season nine of the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. And right now I've recorded episodes up to seven, I think. So next week I'm going to release two of them. So stay tuned for that. It's available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and also Sphinx. If you're into that, it's kind of exciting that you can listen on the Lightning Network. And if you want to pay for the minute, you can actually do that. I'm not saying that you should do it. You can listen to it for free somewhere else, but it, you can still do that for whatever reason. And I also have an RSS feed where you can listen to the episodes for free and without any kind of interference. And you can even open them in Tor or download them locally. My sponsors are very big fans of privacy, so they don't care that I'm not going to have good statistics because of people trying to get more privacy listening to the episodes. But I think that the information can be useful to people living in regimes that are authoritarian and not necessarily able to access some Bitcoin resources. So if I can extend the range of the service to say so, I will happily do it at the expense of having good statistics on Apple podcasts or something, which I kind of hate. I hope that more people listen in a decentralized and permissionless and free way, which doesn't track them and grants them all the privacy and all the sovereignty that they need. And yeah, I also have a website where I write articles and I'm going to publish a magazine that's going to get printed and I'm going to give it away for free at conferences. So that's where I'm at right now. So a lot going on, essentially, which I like. Uh, okay, well, yeah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin takeover. And uh, yeah, I say everyone go check it out um, and see, see what it's up to. And yeah, thanks, Vlad. Uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, take care, everyone. Uh, have an amazing weekend or week whenever you're listening. Um, and remember to buy Bitcoin.